Hi and welcome to this video on iPhone 6S Plus uh, building and repair. So uh, I'm a, a cyber security researcher and uh, when I'm try trying to understand how a computer system works uh, I often like to tear it apart down to its lowest level and, and get quite familiar with it. So this is kind of a byproduct really of some of my uh, research into uh, how I'm going to obtain uh, plenty of iPhones for the purposes of kind of fuzzing and, and various others. So I thought what I'd do is I'd start trying to understand how these iPhones are put together and assembled. And a good way of doing that would be to sort of try and build my own uh, from parts and other material that I could source online. So this here is a iPhone 6S Plus logic board. Uh, you can see that I'm highlighting here the uh, NAND storage, which is on the B side, typically facing away from the user. Uh, this actually is a PCIe storage, uh, which was introduced in the iPhone 6S uh, and su subsequent models. So this is PCIe storage. At the bottom here, you can see uh, the baseband. This is where the baseband processor lives. It's responsible for all the communications. And further up here is the CPU. So this is where the central processing unit on the logic board lives. And this is a blank logic board that uh, I've obtained uh, that basically shows you the layout and location of all the parts um, and is useful for kind of diagnostics purposes. And before I take apart a phone, I like to get a little bit familiar with it. So if I can get schematics or, uh, you know, blank components, uh, then it's very helpful. Uh, at the top here are a number of flex connectors, and these flex connectors are responsible for connecting the uh, logic board to peripherals, such as, you know, the screen and uh, camera modules and various other uh, external sensors that sit uh, on, your, uh, on your mobile device. And so what you're looking at here is essentially kind of like the motherboard of your computer. Uh, it's this central, uh, you know, core uh, that makes up most of what your mobile phone does. And it's a very important component uh, as essentially, you know, it contains the processor, it contains all of the uh, memory and uh, storage, uh, as well as a number of the communication ICs. And in fact, a lot of these ICs that I'm pointing out here uh, are mostly associated with that radio interface. And uh, there are a number of different uh, components that are wired up on there. And if you actually dig around on these boards, you'll see uh, just uh, how small they can really be. So if you look at it under a microscope, for instance, uh, you know, you're going to really struggle if you wanted to try and hand assemble something like this. Um, you know, it's typically assembled with the assistance of robotic machines, um, you know, using a kind of solder mask. Uh, and a human person may, uh, you know, intervene and try to uh, move or amend a, a, com a component. Uh, but to try and assemble uh, a board of this nature, microelectronics, uh, by hand is, uh, is, is require an immense amount of skill and would be incredibly challenging to do without shorting out the pads. Uh, you only have to look at how small some of these um, you know, pads actually are. You look at the, uh, the bottom left there, uh, where you can see a number of resistors that would be, uh, you know, soldered onto the device. Um, you know, it would be very easy for someone who was manually soldering these by hand uh, to bridge or short some of these pads and components. Uh, and of course, you have the BGA uh, or ball grid array components, which need infrared uh, and a special machine uh, to really work with and apply them onto the board. You couldn't do that with kind of hot air or anything else. So these kind of, you know, they're very small components. Um, so if we're looking at the, uh, you know, a logic board, I've been able to, um, you know, get a number of different logic boards from various places. Uh, and in fact, this logic board here is a partially assembled logic board that came from a Foxconn factory. Uh, and it didn't quite make it off the Apple production line in a uh, proper way. Uh, and it is full of all kinds of faults and issues. Um, you know, you can find these from kind of recycling facilities and various other uh, places where perhaps some of these uh, boards were not quite assembled correctly or have issues. But what's useful about that is you can uh, potentially remove some of the components uh, and take components from one board uh, and placing them over and uh, copying them on uh, to another board. Um, you know, that's a, a kind of a process that you may wish to do if you're trying to upgrade the memory of a phone or something similar. Uh, but side by side, you can see uh, you know, these two boards, one is populated and the other isn't. If you did want to start removing components or trying to rework something, you'd use a harness uh, similar to the one that I've got here, uh, where you can basically place your board uh, and rest it onto this, uh, you know, heat resistant, um, you know, uh, pad, where you can then uh, heat it and blast it with hot air. Uh, and this would cause your board not to move around uh, and you could work a little bit easier on the components. So it is kind of useful if you, uh, if you are going to do a little bit of reworking or perhaps you, you're bold enough to try and replace uh, a capacitor or something similar uh, on the device uh, when you're uh, working with you know, a logic board that you've got for repair. Uh, but certainly assembling a logic board from scratch uh, isn't really for the faint of heart and not something you could trivially do without uh, you know, uh, robotic machines, pick and place machines uh, and various others. 
But uh, if we were to take this uh, device now and we can actually, we'll zoom in and have a look at uh, some of the faults that were present on it. Um, but just so we can see how small some of these components really are. Uh, you know, you can see here a number of these ball grid array uh, ICs are misaligned and not quite connected to their pads uh, appropriately. Uh, and you can see that, you know, the components have been placed uh, slightly incorrectly. There's a few, uh, you know, capacitors and things uh, that are misaligned on the uh, top left there. And uh, this, so this, this board uh, didn't make it through the factory process, uh, you know, and it came my way uh, and it could be reflown uh, and worked with. Or interestingly, because it's, uh, you know, contains a number of, uh, you know, uh, ICs and components, uh, these ICs and components might be useful to me uh, if I'm restoring or repairing another board. So perhaps maybe I will uh, strip it for uh, a particular memory chip or something along those lines. And here you can see, again, more of these capacitors not quite in line and some of the components have been flown incorrectly. Uh, and this was just a board that would, didn't quite make it off the production line uh, in a way uh, that was conducive to it actually working. So, you know, it's, it, it does require a complete reflow. So, you know, this uh, particular board, uh, you know, it, it would be a very advanced repair, uh, you know, and you certainly wouldn't want to start from uh, scratch with assembling these. Uh, but if you were to, uh, you know, want to try some of these kind of advanced repairs, you know, removing ICs and placing them onto donor boards, uh, you're going to quite likely need uh, a number of specialist tools. Now, there are a couple of different programmers for the iPhone on the market. Uh, I'm using the JC Pro uh, 1000S, which is a modular based board. Uh, it's a very similar kind of style to Apple's uh, own hardware. It has this kind of touch screen on the top. Uh, it can be powered via a battery, uses an I Apple actual battery. Um, and it has these various modules that uh, slot into the side of it uh, that can perform different functions. So for instance, Apple has uh, hardware uh, locks, so they tie uh, things like the memory chip uh, they try the serial numbers from the memory chips and match them to the Wi-Fi adapter. So if you were, for instance, to take the memory chip off one phone and install it on another, it wouldn't work unless you had actually copied uh, the identifiers of the original memory chip and uh, rewrote them on here. Um, and that's effectively what this kind of programmer does. When you plug that in, I've got a memory chip here taken from an iPhone 6. Uh, what you can do there is you can effectively use that tool to extract information uh, from it. You can't extract the whole memory chip contents, uh, but you can, of course, rewrite the sys configuration data um, that is then used uh, for uh, the purposes of tying hardware together. So if you are going to start removing chips from uh, boards and replacing them, uh, you know, you'll need some specialist tools like this. And there are a couple on the market. There's another one called Wozniak. Uh, and these tools are effectively designed for rewriting the identifiers of the uh, phone ICs. And these two devices are similar devices, but these are designed for rewriting the IDs of the screen. So for instance, if you're taking a screen from a, a newer phone, like an iPhone 7 or an iPhone X, uh, this True Tone uh, screen uh, requires uh, to be paired with the logic board. It must have the same serial number for the functionality to work the same way. Um, and some entrepreneurial uh, hackers in Shenzhen, you know, have created a number of tools that will assist you in these processes. This is one called Clone Boy uh, that would aff effectively allow you to uh, dump the identifiers from an LCD and rewrite them um, so that you can get the full features of a true tone display. And we're working on a 6S Plus, uh, so we don't actually need uh, to clone any of the identifiers aside from, you know, any chips and the touch ID. Uh, as I say, many of these, uh, you know, hardware components are uh, matched to a board. Uh, so they are you know, specifically tied to it. Uh, this is a, an example of a test harness. If you were to uh, you know, take apart your phone and your device, uh, what you may need to do, if you wanna measure, uh, for instance, the voltage or the current going to an LCD, perhaps the LCD backlight isn't turning on correctly, uh, then you would find it very difficult to measure uh, you know, the voltage coming from one of these microelectronic circuits. Um, so these kind of breakout boards, what they do is they have flexi cables that break out to PCBs and give you test pins so that you can actually uh, measure uh, various components uh, on the board and, uh, you know, test things like their resistance and capacitance and, uh, you know, induction and everything else and see whether or not, you know, that component needs to be replaced. So if you're working with like water damaged boards and other things, you might want to get hold of a, a harness like that. Alternatively, because it's specific to one model of phone, uh, this new product has come on the market called Keelan uh, iBridge, and you can get a, these for most models of iPhone all the way up to the iPhone X. 
Uh, and these are essentially uh, flexi cables that break out and they attach directly onto the logic board uh, and give you the ability to um, do those same kind of measurements uh, without the need of that such, you know, large test harness. Um, and these are actually my preferred way of doing it today, uh, as you can get these things for about 20 bucks for each model of phone. Uh, and they've uh, recently come out with them for, you know, all kinds of different models, all the way up to the iPhone X, I believe. So you can use these. Uh, again, for doing those same kind of measurements. So if you're not getting, you know, the, the screen isn't lighting up correctly, perhaps it's not got the right voltage going to it, uh, you could try to isolate the uh, microelectronics components uh, and perhaps resolder or replace, uh, you know, a, a, a capacitor or, um, you know, maybe an IC that isn't uh, functioning correctly. And you can use these to take measurements from a working device and then compare them from one that isn't working. Um, and a really useful bit of kit to have around in your lab. So if you're doing a lot of work on eye, eye devices, um, I certainly recommend these eye bridge devices uh, for working on, uh, you know, more complicated faults. But what we're going to do today is essentially uh, a little bit of a transplant. I've been able to uh, obtain a number of uh, 6S Plus boards. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use some iCloud lock devices as donor phones and uh, replace the logic board and uh, create new phones. So these are the, uh, the 6S Plus logic boards I bought. I paid around $60 for these from eBay. They're stored in these little $2 plastic cases and uh, these are really useful uh, if you, you know, are picking up lots of different logic boards and things. Uh, for storage, I definitely recommend getting your hands on a bunch of these as they sort of fit most form factor uh, of iDevice, uh, certainly any that you would be working on uh, today. Um, and you can get them in bulk, as I say, they cost about two bucks. But uh, these, uh, these uh, you know, storage things are a handy way of keeping your uh, kind of lab organized. I like to keep things like labeled and uh, moved away so that I, uh, I don't lose components and uh, forget which, you know, touch ID is related to what. So this kind of blank PCB board is kind of useful when I'm working on a phone. It's kind of useful to have something like that uh, as reference so you can actually see uh, where all of the different components are expected to live. So I got four of these uh, 6S Plus at auction for 60 bucks a piece. And, uh, you know, I've uh, organized them out here. I, I don't really know the state of them. I couldn't tell you, you know, whether they're working or not. They've been sold to me as working. Um, so I am hopeful that uh, by installing these into a donor phone, uh, we should hopefully get uh, some working phones. So uh, on the subject of uh, donor phones, if you see on the, on the left there, there's a couple more project boxes. Um, these are also uh, really useful. Um, I find them, uh, you know, they cost about five to six dollars, something like that. Uh, and uh, they have a storage area for you to put your phone. They fit most, if not all, models of iPhone. And uh, they have also at the top uh, a small area for you to kind of place your screws and everything else. So this is an example of a donor phone. I paid around 20 bucks for this phone. Uh, it was iCloud locked. Um, you know, if you go to uh, Facebook or, you know, uh, auction websites, police auction websites, things like that, you'll find uh, you can pick up mobile devices in a locked state. Uh, that are sold on for parts and, and spares. So a uh, really useful way of getting hold of uh, cheap components is to uh, purchase, uh, you know, damaged or lost uh, devices, uh, which are no good to anybody and are likely on their way to landfill. Uh, and you can then use these to salvage their parts. And these, uh, these boxes essentially, uh, you know, they allow you to store or work on a device. If you stop working on them, you can put the screws away uh, and they have components uh, for each. So uh, I'm going to uh, power on both of these devices now so we can have a quick look at what, you know, goes into a kind of donor phone. Uh, this device on the right here is iCloud locked, but specifically the one on the left here is actually bypassed. I've done an iCloud bypass. If you're not aware of iCloud bypassing, uh, if you take an activation locked device and exploit it at the bootloader level or similar and gain access to the file system, uh, you know, you could use something like check rain. And what you can do is you can actually rename that setup.application that sprung on the other device there uh, for uh, you know the purposes of uh, activation locks etc and you can actually gain access to springboard and make use of functionality of the phone um, it won't allow you to make phone calls it won't allow you to make use of any apple i services but you can do things like make use of the web browser um, you know or explore some applications etc um, so you know you can bypass these icloud locks and for a security researcher uh, these devices then can uh, in some way assist you if you want to, you know, do some fuzzing or just general vulnerability research. Um, but again, an iCloud bypass device isn't as effective as a full device 
Um, so I'm going to use these uh, the components that are on that device as a donor phone. And this uh, second device here, I have done nothing with it. Uh, I'm not really too interested. You know, the iCloud locked uh, board, uh, you know, is only salvageable to me really for parts. I might remove the um, the storage chip on there, that PCIe storage. Uh, but our goal is really to take these logic boards here and uh, to insert them into these uh, you know lock devices that we paid 20 bucks for, and uh, effectively create our own. Uh, iPhone 6s pluses um, that are you know functioning and are able to work with the various Apple services. The reason I started doing this was that um, you know these devices are fairly expensive if you want to buy a lot of them and uh, I'm trying to build a uh, you know a collection of phones for fuzzing analysis and various other things and obviously paying full market price would get quite costly. So a number of tools that you might need. I go to a company called iFixit. They're based here in California. Uh, they sell a uh, you know professional toolkit for 60 bucks, and that contains uh, most of the uh, adapters and, and screws that you would need, uh, and tools like this for uh, cutting away the adhesive and sliding uh, alongside the screen. And this kind of spudger thing here uh, that we use, uh, it's a plastic device that you use to remove any kind of flex cable contacts uh, and avoid shorting. It's important to make sure you have a plastic one uh, to avoid any kind of shorting. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll effectively take apart one of these phones. I'm going to speed up this video uh, so that you don't have to wait around for uh, you know long periods. But uh, the first thing we'll do is remove these two screws. We'll take the two screws out of the bottom of the iPhone 6s Plus, and that will allow us to uh, then cut away at the adhesive. And you might want to apply some heat uh, to the top of the phone. You can use these pads or a hot air gun uh, to basically loosen the adhesive. And then we'll use a tool like this to cut away and it's important to remember remember the placement of the logic board in this example here um, you've got to be careful you know because inside there are a number of flex cables that are draped around a number of small wires and sensors and things so you want to be really careful that you're not like doing a hack job of that and, and for using too much force as a general rule of thumb when i'm working on uh, you know uh, any kind of mobile or smart device or whatever uh, don't use force uh, you know, you want to use as minimal amount of force as possible. And you can see here by cutting away and lifting the screen up, it opens up uh, away from you, much like an eye for, uh, much like a laptop might. Uh, and the logic board is placed here uh, across the right side of the device. Uh, so we know look, by looking at that logic board uh, where a number of placement of things like flex cables uh, and others might potentially be. You can also look up online, iFixit has a website, they have a number of guides uh, that you can follow, instructional guides for tearing down specific devices. Um, and a really important thing to remember here is to just be patient. Um, you know, don't use too much force, uh, you know, be patient. If something doesn't feel like it's going to move willingly, um, you shouldn't be exerting force. Things will either snap in with minimal force uh, or they will slide out of place uh, without too much effort. Uh, and what I'm doing here now is just going to remove some of the shielding uh, away from where the battery is. And I like to disconnect the battery fairly early on. Uh, you might want to start and disconnect the screen fairly early on as well. Uh, but it's important to, when you remove the battery, to uh, pull that battery connector away uh, so that we don't get uh, any kind of short. We don't want any problems with batteries. Batteries can be a, a little bit of an electrical hazard in your lab environment. Um, so by pulling away that flex contact from the battery, disconnecting the power from this device, uh, you know, it's not going to short itself or power itself back on. And I just tend to, you know, bend that connector out the way a little bit. Don't, again, don't apply too much force. So uh, simply taking apart these devices here, uh, you can see there are a number of cables. Always remove the SIM tray. That was a step that we just took there. Um, it should be the, one of the first steps that you do is always make sure you've got the SIM tray out as it's a very easy thing to forget. And, uh, you know, when you've taken all the screws out and you can't see anything else there, it can be that one thing that uh, causes a bit of damage. And the next thing I'll do is remove the shielding from the top here uh, so that I can get the screen off by removing the three flex connectors uh, that affix it to the logic board of the device. And so by removing these, uh, this shielding here, uh, we can essentially um, disconnect that screen uh, and then we're able to uh, you know, work on the board more easily. Uh, contrary to popular belief, you don't actually need to remove all of the sensors and components from a chassis uh, of an eye device. You can actually just unscrew many of the uh, connecting uh, screws, such as this main screw at the top here that holds it uh, down to the actual chassis, uh, and the logic board will actually slide out. So you don't need to actually go ahead and remove every single component from the device, uh, but you know you will need to remove the screen. Uh, and removing the screen fairly on the steps are fairly similar uh, for the iPhone um, 6 through right through to the iPhone uh, 8 Plus. Uh, the iPhone X has been significantly re-engineered purely, I believe, for the purpose of making things like this more difficult to do. 
Um, but if you were to look through the, uh, you know, the various screws and things here, and again, you can see I'm using a plastic tool um, to test and pry away at any of the contacts that um, remove any of the, uh, you know, adhesive that might be um, keeping these cables in place. It's important not to use a metal tool uh, as you will scratch and damage the logic board, um, you know, and thus could cause a short or indeed, uh, you know, cause a cut uh, on a trace or something like that and make the, make the board effectively useless. When I want to salvage these boards, I still want the I, I like devices, I still want to be able to keep these boards. Uh, I might have the use for them in future projects. So I'm removing now the, uh, the screws across the side here so that we can uh, remove another flex cable. Um, there are a number of different uh, pigtails as well, uh, which require careful removal um, from the device. Uh, you've got to be really careful. These are affixed into the device and they actually have little metal snaps. Uh, that snap in. You can see I pulled some of the wires up to the uh, side there. You can see just hanging off uh, from the board. But you've got to be very careful uh, not to exert too much force. You don't want to snap any of these cables or snap off any of the components um, as that could render your uh, new donor phone slightly useless or indeed completely damage some of the uh, sensors and require further uh, work and repair. But once we've removed kind of all the screws, uh, we can see here that I can now slide up the logic board and it will actually just slot out of place uh, once, it's, uh, once all the screws have been removed. And uh, I've just cut through ahead on the video here and slowed it down a little bit so we can uh, take a little bit more of a, a look at what's going on. And uh, what we'll do is just uh, remove this final screw uh, that keeps the board uh, affixed uh, onto, uh, you know, keeps the logic board affixed to that chassis. And once we've got that kind of main screw out, it's one that's got a weird kind of head to it. It's very unusual. Uh, it's got a kind of security screw, I guess. Uh, once you've got that, uh, you know, that uh, removed, you know, sliding uh, out the logic board uh, and replacing it should be, uh, you know, much, much more easy. And it should just pop right out. Um, so, you know, we check that all of the, uh, you know, all of these flex cables have been removed. If there's any adhesive that might be left over uh, that could get in the way from us reconnecting them, uh, we can pull that off the board uh, and, uh, you know, not do any damage in the process. And again, that's why it's important to use a plastic tool instead of a metal one, which can scrape and scratch. Uh, you know, a little plastic tool will help you uh, remove things like a little bit of glue or whatever. So here we can see I've got, the, got hold of the logic board from the bottom and I'm actually just going to slide it out from the device um, you know, without exerting too much force uh, and it will just slot out, uh, you know, so I don't need to go ahead and remove that camera module. I don't need to remove, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the antennas uh, that are connected at the top there. If you remove them, uh, it will certainly be a little bit easier. Uh, and you can see there that I've actually forgotten a screw uh, and that's why it's important, you know, not to pull on things too hard, not to exert any force. If you find that there's perhaps a screw in place and you can just see it uh, and then you can remove it, you know, you don't, don't exert force, apply a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pressure, not, no more than you would if you were, uh, you know, gently pressing on someone's wrist to take their pulse. Uh, you don't want to be applying any kind of more pressure than that really uh, to a phone uh, in any shape or form. It doesn't really matter uh, what phone you're working on. You should always be using a very light touch. Uh, you know, microelectronics will usually snap into place. They'll have contacts in place and screws. But once you've actually, um, you know, removed all of those screws, uh, things will slide out with minimal force. You don't need to use any kind of excess force on this kind of thing. So once I've removed this uh, iCloud locked uh, device, in fact, I think this was the bypassed one, uh, what, we, what we'll do now is, you know, we'll keep that logic board uh, and put it to one side. But remember that um, the hardware, the Apple hardware, you know, ties components together. So you'll find that, you know, a touch ID is paired with a specific board. And if you connect a different touch ID, uh, that touch ID will no longer work. And you can, in fact, get some kind of generic uh, touch IDs. A lot of work gets done in Shenzhen on, uh, you know, reverse engineering, uh, you know, these uh, ICs and, and making tools to allow you to change identifiers. Um, you know, particularly something called the sysconfig data. Uh, and this sysconfig data is what's used for tying uh, various portions of, you know, serial numbers and making sure that they match. But in this instance, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, use, uh, you know, a, a clean logic board that we've obtained from auction. So we've got this donor phone, the donor phone costs $20 uh, and this, uh, you know, clean logic board uh, costs uh, $60. So we've got here, you know, a phone, uh, you know, a commercial phone uh, that's available in the market for around $150 to $180 uh, and we're going to use $80 worth of parts uh, to essentially reassemble them. And then what I'll do is I'll just slide 
uh, that logic board uh, back into place where the old one was. Again, not applying too much force. I don't want to make any extra work for myself if I can avoid it. Um, I don't want to snap any components or any wires. Uh, and it's important to remember, uh, you know, that some of these flex cables will get trapped underneath the logic board. Uh, and that's what I'm doing there. You can't really see it on the camera, but I'm just making sure that I've got my hand pulling those flex cables out from underneath the board um, so that when I'm inserting it, uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, catch them uh, and trap some of the components under the board. What I want to do is just slide it in uh, without, uh, you know, uh, having to remove all of the components from the chassis. Again, if you're a little bit inexperienced, you might want to actually just take off all the components. Um, you know, the more you disassemble, uh, you know, the, 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 the easier uh, things will be. Uh, but it's important when you are disassembling something to uh, keep the screws in an order upon which you've taken them out and, um, and in a way that you can remember them. And that's why I like this little mat I've got here is it allows me to store uh, screws in an ordered format. Uh, and then uh, when I'm reinserting those screws back into the device, um, you know, I'm able to do it in the same way that they came in because the screws do have different depths and different densities. And, uh, you know, you'll find that if you screw them into the wrong place that, you know, the reassembly of the board, uh, you might end up with screws left over or in the worst case, uh, threaded screws, uh, which can be difficult to remove. If that happens to you, um, you know, maybe use a pair of pliers uh, or a screw extraction tool, uh, which has spikes on the end of it um, to help you remove it. Um, but you want to try and avoid, uh, you know, uh, any of that kind of behavior. So once I've inserted the uh, logic board, and what you can see here now is I'm able to power up the device and uh, I've reassembled the, uh, the chassis. I put all the screws back in the right way. And uh, the iPhone now is essentially, uh, you know, a fully working uh, iPhone 6S Plus. And uh, we're able to go in and, and make use of the apps and, and, all, and all the other various things and, uh, you know, do some testing on there uh, and check that it works. And I've actually been able to sign in with this device now. So, uh, you know, I know that it's all uh, fully functioning and working. So I'm not just going to do this once. I, you know, I've got enough parts here to do two phones at the moment. So I'm going to do a second phone again, uh, and we'll speed up that uh, that process. Uh, but it's just I wanted to show you really um, that you know you can do this yourself. You know, you, you just uh, you can get some various tools and components, and you don't need a lot of tools um, to disassemble a phone. Uh, but certainly for diagnostics and troubleshooting, uh, you'll want to make sure you've got things like a good bench power supply. Uh, a soldering reworking station. Uh, I have a microscope there that's just at the top of the screen, which is giving off that bright light. Um, you know, so apologies for the, uh, you know, the lighting here in this uh, video sometimes. I'm uh, still figuring out how, the, uh, how to use this camera. Um, so yeah, so once I've reassembled uh, this uh, device, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with that one. Uh, then I'll actually uh, set it to one side and uh, you know, consider that a, um, you know, a, a decent, uh, decent phone that I can now use uh, for my um, cybersecurity research efforts. And uh, you know, what I'm trying to do here really is avoid the cost of paying the full retail price of mobile phones and um, recover phones that might be going to landfill or uh, you know, try and prevent devices and, and do some recycling uh, from electronic components and restoring them uh, so that we uh, you know, reduce the amount of waste uh, that we are uh, creating as people. Um, so this one here, you know, I'm testing it out. We can see uh, the screen looks a little bit dark. Uh, and in fact, I did need to reassemble this phone and take it apart again. Things like that can happen sometimes. And, and the reason is, you know, there was a little bit of adhesive uh, that was, uh, you know, blocking one of the contacts on the uh, flex cable uh, and simply, uh, you know, removing that adhesive and reseating that flex cable uh, was sufficient to, uh, you know, uh, address any shortcomings of the device. So this is the uh, second device now, which we've actually disassembled and uh, already placed the logic board in. Uh, but it wasn't booting. There was uh, an issue here with the power. Um, so I've got this uh, power cable, um, which is called a shark power cable. There's actually better versions of these cables available now, uh, but they actually contain uh, adapters for wiring it directly to a logic board and providing external power. And this is why I say you should get a really good bench power supply that allows you to see visually the voltage and amperage, um, you know, so that you can uh, investigate whether uh, a device is really turning on uh, and also how much current it's drawing to try and ascertain at the very basic level, um, you know, is it powering and why, why isn't it? Um, but it's important here, these cables, you've got to be really careful with them uh, as, uh, you know, they are live 
uh, and there are sometimes crocodile clips and various other things just hanging off them uh, and they uh, you know they are they do carry current so it's not like the the power is going to just one of those cables uh, and that's what I was doing there is just moving it out of the way um, and you can see the device isn't powering on uh, or it is powering on uh, and we can't see something on the screen so it's possible I've got a loose contact or whatever so I will simply uh, go back into the device uh, and disconnect the battery and connect it to my bench power supply uh, so that I can view uh, what the voltage and what the amperage on this uh, device are uh, and see if the measurements there are in line with what I would expect. Um, and the way that I do that is I set my bench power supply to match the output voltage uh, and a similar level of uh, possible current uh, you know at the same kind of level and for an iPhone, you know, you don't need an awful lot of amperage um, You know, I think it's maybe uh, 0.6 or 0.5 uh, is sufficient uh, amps. You don't even need a full amp um, So, you know, uh, I'm usually around 3.7 volts and sometimes some of the batteries I think might be, uh, you know, 4.7 uh, But generally typically speaking, uh, you know, you don't need a, a, a you know, a high voltage uh, power supply and you don't need a lot of amperage so we're going to kind of cut through some of this because uh, it's kind of a long process of just taking the device apart uh, and skip to the product now where uh, we've been able to re-power the device uh, and uh, you know test it and find out what was wrong with it. And essentially all it was, it was a little bit of adhesive again, uh, kind of keeping that screen contact uh, from being made. So it's important when you take these things apart to make sure that you have seated the cables correctly. Um, so I've installed these two logic boards into this, uh, these 6S Pluses. Um, so these were previously iCloud lock devices, um, which I obtained for $20. Uh, and as you can see now, uh, they're actually running, uh, you know, a full uh, recent build of um, iOS. Uh, and both devices are working. And because I got them with the, uh, the Touch ID, and I'm using the same Touch ID that was paired with the board, uh, all of the features that a end consumer uh, would expect to work, uh, such as the Touch ID, uh, are actually working on these devices. So that is how you can effectively um, buy iPhone uh, components and parts, get them from auction websites, Facebook, social media websites, things like that, uh, and take those components and parts, take iCloud lock devices as do do donor devices, essentially as phones, uh, and use the components from these otherwise uh, useless devices uh, and repurpose them and uh, you know repair them in such a way that you can now have functioning phones. You have some uh, you know worthwhile device that you can spend your time on. And I, I need to do this uh, quite a lot uh, as I'm trying to fuzz phones and trying to analyze different kinds of devices and security. If I was to buy all of the phones that I'm looking at at full market rate, um, I simply couldn't afford it. Um, and that's why even if you looked at the latest iPhone X, uh, you can get all the parts for an iPhone X uh, perhaps for maybe $300, uh, you know, get an iCloud lock device, get some of the latest logic boards, get the paired uh, face ID, because that one has a, it needs the cameras to be paired. Um, and you can then, uh, you know, assemble one of those devices. However, I would say that the iPhone X is a particularly advanced phone uh, to try and do work on. Uh, and you would be, uh, you know, well placed. I tend to do a lot of work uh, on iPhone 6 to iPhone 8 plus uh, type devices, which are still recent enough that there's enough in circulation uh, and cheap enough that you can obtain them, uh, you know, secondhand uh, and from recycling facilities uh, for a price that is, um, you know, reasonable uh, and, uh, you know, useful for you uh, when you are trying to just, uh, you know, acquire lots of devices or you're doing some kind of research or whatever. Uh, and obviously, you know, iCloud bypass devices are very cool in themselves and would only cost you 20 bucks, uh, but you don't get the iCloud features. You can't make use of some of Apple's services. Um, so whilst they are good for people who might be interested in doing uh, web browser analysis, uh, they don't quite meet the bar uh, for someone that might be doing, um, you know, uh, kernel level exploitation or even, um, you know, uh, iCloud or iMessage exploitation or anything like that. So you might find that uh, they don't quite meet the, uh, the thing. And again, getting a good power supply uh, is a really essential piece of lab kit. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm going to take a quick look at the phones now in their final state. Um, this is how they, uh, they looked at their finish point. And uh, I want to thank you all uh, for watching this video. And please do leave some uh, comments and some feedbacks. If you enjoy this video, uh, we may well start making more of these uh, and doing some video logging of some of the kind of activities we get up to in our lab. Um, so there you go. These are two iPhone 6S Pluses that were created essentially uh, from parts.